It's really nice to be here. I'm doing something a little bit different for today's talk. So nominally, I would pick a sort of a research thread through my lab and, and share a little bit about that. I'm doing something a little bit different today because I'm taking I don't know, 20, 30 steps back from all the work that we've been doing in the past seven plus years. Um, and turning, turning this a little bit into, here is what I've come to see as my perspective on interaction. So it's a very high level talk. We won't really look at, uh, we won't really get a chance to dive into details, but I wanted to share with you how I think about the, pro the, the problem formulation itself. What problem are we trying to solve when we talk about interaction with humans? Um, and uh, what aspects of these problem um, are important, what should solutions look like, and how should that inform sort of the algorithms that we're uh, building. Um, and so um, kind of taking a step back, I'm immersed in this world of robotics. I have friends who start robotics companies. Um, I have uh, not as many robots as you guys have at Stanford, but I have um, one or two robots in my lab, um, like this arm here that I like a lot. Um, I spend one day a week with an autonomous driving company um, here in, in, um, in Silicon Valley called Waymo, part of the sort of the alphabet ecosystem. Um, today I won't talk about Waymo work, but uh, so I wanted to make that very clear. Um, I'm really just wearing my Berkeley, uh, you see Berkeley hat. Uh, but what I can share is um, that um, uh, there's, it, it's a, it, it, I experience these robots day to day, right? So um, here I am driving, taking one of the first uh, rider only uh, rides in San Francisco. Um, and it's really cool, like it's, it's nice to, to be experiencing robots that make decision after decision in sort of the correct way. Um, and uh, so, so it's just, it's very, it's an exciting place to be, right? So I'm surrounded by robots and everything I do. And you'll see even more of that in some examples that I'll give. How did I get into robotics? Well, I got into robotics. Um, I was in, in 12th grade, about to go to university. Um, and um, I came across Stuart Russell and Peter Norvig's book. Um, and I read it as much as I could understand, right, as a 12th grader, okay, what did I know? But I, I, I got some things out of this, and what, was, what really resonated with me back then was this concept of the way the book was talking about an intelligent agent. Like, what's an intelligent agent? It's sort of this agent that figures out what to do. You give it a goal, and it figures out how to sequence its decisions to achieve that goal on its own. And that concept right there was the thing that really drew me in, right? It was, just, it was so fascinating that you could do this. Um, so I've learned that you know the way robots work, um, just to kind of establish some common terminology, is they take actions that change the state of the world. Um, they have sensors that tell them about what is there in the world, um, and then you give them some objective, um, a reward function, cost function, goal, whatever you want to call it, and they figure out how to go about and achieve it, a sequence of actions, a policy that achieves it. Um, and we call this many things. Um, I'm gonna refer to it as optimal decision making in this talk, um, optimal control on the control side. Um, and what's cool about optimal decision making, I think, is that it enables robots to figure out their own strategies for interacting with the physical world. What do I mean by strategies? And that's gonna be a bit, we're gonna use this word again and again and again in the talk. What do I mean by strategies? Well, um, this example, when I teach intro to AI, I give this example, and I think it's somewhat illustrative. So here's a cute uh, toy example, robot in a maze. Uh, there's a gem here, it gets plus one if it catches in on that. If it falls into the fire pit, um, negative one, game ends. Um, it can go up, down, left, right, and there's a little bit of noise. So if it tries to go up with 80% chance, it ends up actually in the next cell, unless there's a wall, in which case it stays in place. But there's a 10% chance of like wheels sleeping a little bit, and it ends up either on the left or on the right. Um, so that's a task, and you can solve it, right, through optimal decision making, in this case value iteration, you know everything about the world, um, and this is what the solution looks like. And so, you know, some things make a lot of sense, like you, if you start here, right, you make your way towards the jam. If you start here, you go this way around rather than that way, why is that? 
minus one because the mind because of the risk of minus one right if you were to pass by the fire pit that would be bad um, and it's really cool what happens here the robot doesn't go up it goes left where's it go left So, yeah, so certain, right? Like this, um, if it went up, there'd be this 10% chance of ending up here, and then it would get negative one, and the game would end. And so, what it does is it sort of bangs its head against the wall or presses against the wall um, and leans on it so that there, and, and it keeps doing that, and there's always a 10% chance that it's up to the left or the right. Now, I bet that we could write this down. Um, if we all sat and, and thought about it. But I looked at this and I was like, huh, that's kind of cool. And that's sort of what I mean by a strategy, right? This notion of like bang your head against the wall to, um, instead of the obvious thing to do, to avoid falling into this fire pit, which this is this cute little strategy that optimal decision making just gives you. Um, and um, uh, I have now a, a, a kid, uh, his name is Lucas, he's one, and um, he is coming up with this sort of strategy as well. He's learning to walk, and uh, he can't really walk, he, he falls a lot. And so what he started doing before actually being able to fully walk is he sort of discovered that he can just like lean against the wall and, and make progress that way. Um, so, and he's also really cute. Uh, so uh, I think there's something really beautiful here. Um, and I, as we'll see in a bit, also practical about really not having to specify to the robot what to do, what actions to take, how to behave, um, and uh, to just give it an objective or a reward function and for it to automatically figure out that in order to be robust, right, how do you do that? You press against a wall or something like that. Um, and if I change the, f the problem a little bit, like if I change you know, where this wall is, or in this case, if I make it a, this corresponds to sort of the every step costs a little bit. If I make it a little bit more costly per action, you know, all of a sudden it's not really worth it to, you kind of, you take the risk because it's not worth it to wait until the forward action or the left action resolves into, the, into that um, left or right motion. So, um, so you get this notion of generalization as you tweak the problem setting. There's something else that's optimal to do, and the robot can figure that out. So, um, with this, this was an illustrative example. Now, give, let me give you a research one. So, it was back in 2010. I was in grad school at CMU. And Rob Platt gave this talk on exactly the kind of sort of beautiful emergent strategy that was, was so fascinating to me. Um, so this is the like dark domain. The robot starts at a start, there's a goal, but it's dark. It doesn't know exactly where it is. And its sensors work better in the light than in the dark. And so if it tries to go towards the goal, it might not get to it with enough accuracy because it doesn't exactly know where it is and uncertainty also accumulates over time. Um, and so what Rob was talking about is the sort of the underlying PalmDB formulation and ways to approximate it. And, and the solution to that, what um, he showed was emergent was this behavior where the robot makes its way into the light in order to sort of collapse its uncertainty and gather enough information about its location just enough so that it can then go and make it with enough certainty to to the goal. And so again, you know, you do optimal decision making, you figure out things like that you should be moving towards the light, so away from your goal, moving towards the light to make sure you can actually do the task properly, how to move towards the light, right, how much, and so on, as all these details are, are kind of figured out. Good, so um, I'll greatly, greatly simplify here, but I think essentially the message is you take a robot, um, you kind of tell it the basics of how the world works, some version of F equals MA, some version of how the physical world behaves. And all of a sudden it does magical things um, on its own. And this is a video from Stanford, from uh, Zico's uh, work of just, you know, even superhuman performance being attained through optimal decision making. But while these techniques could enable these robots to kind of go off and do these magical things, I was also disappointed in grad school that they were nowhere sort of near 
enough. They're far from being enough because if you look at sort of all these pictures of robots out in the wild doing their thing, there's something missing. And of course, the title of my talk will give you a hint as to <laughs> what is missing. What's missing is the people, right? When will a car go around and there's this beautifully empty road with no one in sight? No, the world for an autonomous car looks more like this, or you have to actually um, interact with all these different agents, make predictions about where they're going, what's going on with them, and make sure you coordinate well with them um, as opposed to just you know, stay on the road um, and drive forward. Um, even um, one of my favorite robots is Wally, -E. and even Wally, -E, right? Um, uh, I, I would say it's not enough for robots to work once we killed off the planet and moved away to space. If you haven't seen Wally, -E, please go watch it. It's such a good movie. It's not just for kids. It's a great Pixar movie for adults as well. Um, um, so yeah, it's not it's not enough to actually make robots work once humans have left the planet, um, or to make robots work only on Mars, they're around. The quadrotors can't escape humans either, so we use them to take videos of us as we're skiing, snowboarding, running, and so on. That's what Adam does at Skydio. Um, and Mikey is getting married, so Adam lent us one of these, and here I am. Um, getting married, this is my husband Chris, this is my family, and we had this drone that was navigating around, figuring out where the people are, taking pictures of us, and so on. It was very noisy, though, very noisy, so we had to kind of pause the ceremony for this thing to, anyway, work in progress. Even Wally -E made itself super useful to me before we killed off the planet. Um, so Chris built this and actuated it, um, and it rolled in on New Year's Eve one night in uh, one year, and it popped up this Lego box that opened up, and there was an engagement ring, and that was his proposal. <laughs> so I'd like to say that the bar is, you know, that's just very high now for proposing marriage. Um, so, uh, so, so, you know, robots have to deal with people. People are everywhere. And after a couple years in grad school of working on optimization for robot manipulation, working on these robotics problems, it really started to bug me that we have these great optimal decision-making tools for robots that act in isolation. But it seemed like the moment there was also a person around, even in the same space as the robot, uh, like you know, someone in this diagram sort of walking uh, in wanting a coffee refill or something like that, it's as if none of that worked anymore. All of these tools kind of gone. We couldn't really use any of that machinery. And we were back to things like, um, telling the robot what actions to take, or telling the robot what strategy to use. And I have many examples of these, but I think one that kind of connects to sort of later on in the talk and the work that Dorsey ended up doing was um, in 2010, I was reading, yeah, I was reading these papers, Rob Platt, Light Dr. Main, magical things happening with optimal decision making. Uh, I was at CMU, Google just started their autonomous driving project. And um, this article, a bunch of my friends went to work there. This article comes out and is describing this funny situation where they were testing the car and it gets stuck at a four-way stop because um, uh, essentially it pulls over, it comes to a stop, um, there's a person there, the person inches forward as people do, the car predicts the person will go, it waits for them to go. By the time it gets it together to start driving again, there's another person who had inched forward into the intersection. Um, the car predicts that it was about to go, it lets the person go and so on and so forth until the test driver took over control and sort of this, this thing made it. I think it's in the New York Times, I'm not sure. Um, so, um, Later, I talked to Sebastian Thrun, and he tells me, well, what did they have to do? They had to sort of program in this inching forward behavior for the car as well. It was like humans inch forward into these intersections. The car shouldn't just go there, come to a complete stop. It should sort of, you know, kind of assert its turn also by when it's a turn, inch forward into the intersection. Um, and so there was a human programmer who had to figure out sort of what strategy the car should be using. Where was all this like crazy machinery that gave us beautiful strategies that enable robots to figure out what to do? Um, 
we, there was none of that. We had to kind of go back and say, like, here, in this situation, inching forward is the appropriate thing to do. Here's how you inch forward and so on. And that's really frustrating. Um, and it's not just because uh, you have to come up with these, these strategies. Maybe that would be fine. Maybe that would be a way to build robots that interact with people. Um, but unfortunately, at some point, it really becomes unscalable for robots to operate by designers sitting down and figuring out what their strategies should be. Right. So uh, a few years later, another article <laughs> about Waymo um, talks about how the car gets stuck taking an exit because it was trying to merge on, and there was heavy traffic, and there was not enough a, a big enough gap in traffic. And so the car couldn't actually make its lane change and ending up sort of continuing on to the exit. So the similar thing, like the four-way stop at some high level. But you know, you, it's an inching forward doesn't solve it. You have to come up with a different strategy and adapt it now to, well, um, how should that work? How should it depend on how much traffic there is? When do I do it? When do I not? And so on and so forth. And then there's all sorts of other problems that even look qualitatively different. Like um, I like to show this example of imagine that I am um, I have this robot where I'm loaded in dishwasher or something like that, and it's carrying this cup and it's going to go and set it on the table. But I look at it. And I'm thinking, well, you're sure holding this very high up from the ground. So I get a little bit concerned, because if it drops it, it will break. That's not kind of the right way to carry this. What I might do, well, I might say something. But I might also just push on the robot and kind of correct what it's doing. Right? Be like, you've got to stay closer to the table. Now, a robot that does optimal decision making, um, what does it do upon having this external torque applied to it. Well, the moment I let go, it's like, well, let me go back to doing the task in what I thought was the optimal way, which was clear to have a nice clearance from the table. So I keep pushing, it keeps going back, and I keep pushing, and it keeps going back, and so on and so forth. Um, so we call this physical interaction. And clearly, this too, we needed some strategy for, right? This is not what the robot is doing is not the correct thing. And so as designers, we can sit down. We can think of, well, what would be the appropriate response? People have actually thought about this. They talked about rendering an impedance. They talked about moving in the direction of the force. They talked about rejecting the force. Of, as a disturbance. They talked about entering some sort of gravity compensation mode and letting the person guide you towards the end, and so on and so forth. There's many ways to go about it. Unclear which one of these strategies would be sort of the right way to go for this sort of problem, if any of them. And so that's a long-winded way of saying, um, is there an alternative? What would it take for robots to actually figure out the right strategies for interaction with humans? In the same way, they're sort of figuring out the right strategies for interacting with the physical world, which is something that we've made a lot of progress in. Uh, optimal decision making enables the robots to figure out what to do with the physical world. How do we make it? also enable robots to figure out the right strategies for dealing with people. So I became really fascinated by this problem um, where, you know, for instance, instead of having to say, hey, robot, in this situation, you should inch forward, I sure like to say, do your job just like you do your job in isolation, but now also do it in coordination with this human who is in the intersection. Figure it out and have the robot sort of make sure that it does the right sort of negotiation coordination with the person. How, um, how might we do that? And I spent really kind of my research career so far exploring this type of question, exploring how to go from sort of this robot in isolation model to actually something where the human is part of this formulation, where the, we kind of, the human becomes part of the state that we're considering when we do optimal decision making. How do I make the human, how do I put the human, human sort of formally in there so that when I do optimal decision making, the robot can actually figure out how to do these things in coordination with people? Um, and what's tough about this is that with the physical world, we can get these things done because we understand something about how the physical world works. We understand sort of the dynamics of the physical state. We know laws of physics. And so that's sort of either, you know, we can write those things down, we can parameterize them, or at the very least, it, it influences the kind of sort of data-driven models we use. For interaction, 
what do you do? Like, what's the equivalent uh, of F equals MA? And in, in, in theory, there's neuroscience, right, that sort of tells you that what laws govern the human brain, but we're nowhere near actually understanding really any of that, right? So I kind of like write down equations like F equals MA for the brain, um, but that's what we're talking about when it talks about like, well, now the human is part of your state. So, so what do we do? Is there an F equals MA for interaction, um, uh, and, and you kind of, how do we get there? And I think the answer is yes. I think I've come to this conclusion that roughly, if we formulate this optimal decision-making problem as what is called a partially observable general sum game, which is something that I'll spend the rest of the talk kind of going through, um, it turned out that, at least in my view, um, if we acknowledge that the human is also an agent that doesn't act arbitrarily but takes actions sort of that have something to do with some objective that they have, um, uh, just like the robot takes action according to its objective, um, that we kind of capture this interplay between human actions and robot actions um, that that this kind of really gives us not, not everything about interaction, but that sort of F equals MA-like structure that we need, that we can use to build upon when we develop interaction algorithms. So, you know, that doesn't mean that people are sort of rational game playing agents, that's not true, far from it. Um, but I think much like F equals MA kind of um, captures some of what's going on, but not all, um, this too is more like, giving us the underlying structure of how we should think about interaction. And so what I figured I'd do for the rest of today is gonna go through what all these you know, errors and words actually mean and what sort of implications they have for the way we've been thinking about interaction problems and what sort of strategies for interactions have emerged when we've been able to formulate interaction this way. And so first, you'll notice that I call it a game. Right? So what's a game? A game is this mathematical construct. Um, I don't want you to think of something like chess when I say game. I more want you to think about the game of chicken. You know, who knows the game of chicken? Okay, few people do. Roughly, you have two cards going at each other. And they get some payoff depending on what each other does. So if they both swerve and avoid each other, that's okay. That's sort of zero, zero, nothing happened. No one won, but no one lost. Um, if they both go straight and keep going straight, they go, they run into each other, and that's really bad for both of them. So that's negative a thousand, negative a thousand. And if they, um, uh, you know, one goes straight and the one on one dodges, then sort of the one who goes straight wins in this game of chicken. Um, so they each have a utility or payoff, which depends on not just what they do, but what the other player ends up doing as well. Um, you might have heard of the prisoner's dilemma, sort of similar concept there. What did these have to do with humans and robots coexisting? Well, you know, let's go back to this coordination at the, at the four-way stop. So what's going on here is that I have the human and a robot, they each have a goal, they, they, and it's a kind of a complex goal in that they both want to go through first, ideally. They both value their own efficiency, but they also all both want to avoid collisions with each other. No one wants to kind of get into a wreck on the road. Um, so much like in this kind of chicken game that we were talking about, each of their utilities depends on what the other does. I can't just look at the robot and say, how good is an action for the robot? It really depends on what the human also decides to do at the same time. And the combination of the human action and the robot action end up dictating sort of the outcome of this. Um, so that means that what one does ends up influencing what the other does and vice versa. And I think that's what this kind of game formulation enables us to capture. Um, each agent takes actions in service of their own objective, um, and that results in this influence back and forth between the human and the robot. Now you might wonder, in theory this is true, 
in practice, do we really play chicken with each other on the road? Like, is that sort of what, <laughs> what we want? Uh, come on. And it turns out the answer is, is in small ways, yes. In small ways, kind of more often than you might think, you kind of exercise your game theoretical muscles as you're driving on the road. And here's an example, and this is from Durst's work. So here I have a car and I have um, a human-driven vehicle, and if I don't think about any game aspect, what I'll do is I'll make a prediction about this dynamic obstacle as moving forward, and I'll say, I need to not collide with this human, good thing. Um, I also need to, to get myself into the left lane, but I have to do that without colliding with the person, and so I need to brake, let the person go, and then try to go on, um, after them, unless there's another car coming, right? In which case, I'll wait for that person to go to, and so on and so forth. Or, so that's one option. Or I can keep going so that I don't slow down and annoy the person behind, but then, you know, I will mix my, my left turn, so I'll have to reroute. So those are sort of the two options, right? As humans, I think most of you do not accept that those are your two options. As humans, you invent a third option which is to nudge yourself in there and expect the person behind to slow down and create that gap in traffic that wasn't there. And that's what I mean by you're exercising your game theoretical muscles because in order for you to know that that's a thing that you can do, you have to reason about this person as taking actions that depend on the actions that you take as well. And that coupling, that mutual influence between your action and their action is what a game theoretic formulation enables us to capture. And so much like in the four-way stop scenario, right, the human has a goal, the human wants to go first, but the human wants to avoid collisions too, which means their utility depends on what our, the robot does, uh, which means that what the robot does influences what the human does. And once you do this, and, and um, Dorse was really the, the first person to um, kind of enable uh, a game theoretic uh, approximation that captures this mutual influence, uh, then you end up with this sort of behavior where the car figures out, yeah, I can go in front and expect the person to slow down a little bit. And not only do you get that sort of strategy, but you also get the generalization where, of course, if the car starts like way in front, right, it does something slightly different. If the car starts way in the back of the person, it doesn't try to go for it. It doesn't accelerate and get in front of the person because that'd be kind of stupid. It's sort of then it breaks and, and goes behind. And now I want to share with you, um, I think this is still, to this day, my favorite strategy that came out of any kind of interaction that we've studied. Um, and uh, this was said RSS paper <laughs> that I wanted to get drinks after <laughs> writing with Dorsa. Um, and um, I remember this very vividly because, you know, it's like, of course, down to the wire and we're still looking at results and so on. And um, Dorsa comes to my office and she says, okay, I did this thing that we agreed to and, um, you know, it makes sense in this situation and that situation, but there's this really weird thing happening with the four-way stop scenario that we were looking at. So let me, sh let me share with you what the weird thing was that was happening. So what we did here is um, we put the car at a four-way stop with a human. Uh, this was in a simulation. Um, and we gave the, we changed the reward function for the autonomous car. Its utility was no longer, you know, get, get through the intersection as quickly as possible, don't collide. Now we had this very courteous autonomous car that wanted to, um, it was incentivized for how quickly the human was getting through the intersection. Right? So you can imagine that in a world where autonomous cars are riding empty and they don't have to be in a hurry and so on, they might actually want to be nice to the people around as opposed to compete to, with the people around. And so, so this was a very courteous autonomous car. And so imagine you're this car, right? Um, what would you do? What would you do if your job was to do something that, and, and you're, you get brownie points, really for not how much you man progress you managed to make, but this person who stopped at the same time as you, how quickly they managed to get through the intersection. Right, thoughts? 
People sometimes say flash their lights. Reverse. So motion, okay, the car can do the motion. Okay, reverse, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, there's, there's, the, there's the kind of hand gesture stuff, uh, lights, but lights can be a confusing signal because you know, when, whenever people flash their lights at me, I don't know if they're yelling at me to like stop or they're telling me to go. Um, anyway, um, Dorsa came to my office and said, the car is backing up. <laughs> 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 and she had a, she was ambivalent about this. And I was like, oh my God, that is so cool. <laughs> I cannot believe that this is happening. Um, and and if, you, if you probe at it, it's not something that I've seen humans do, but basically in a sort of game theoretic model, right? The car models the person as wanting to go first, but also wanting to avoid collisions. If you're removing yourself as a collision sort of threat, then it makes sense that they, they would go. Um, so, so under this model, it makes sense. It's a cute little strategy that the car came up with that is not what I would have thought about. Um, and, um, and then we ran a user study, and I kid you not, people went faster through the intersection. So this is a user study with people you know, in, driving in the simulator. And what's really cool is that there are papers in human-robot interaction being written about this so-called back-off strategy. So people haven't proposed this for cars, just to be clear. But we have found papers where people propose this sort of thing for um, robots that navigate around people. So imagine that we're walking there, and the robot and I get at this bottleneck, which is the door, at about the same time. HRI designers have proposed that what the robot should do at that point is to sort of like drive backwards a little bit and sort of let the person go through. And this is called the back off strategy and people have you know, evaluated in the context of navigation. And here it was as really just a natural consequence, an emergent property of enabling the robot to understand that there's this mutual influence between the robot's actions and the human's actions. Once we gave it that, we gave it this objective of being nice to people, all of a sudden this is like something that actually the robot figured out. And so that's what the game aspect enables, and that's why I think it's important to think of interaction in this sort of game theoretic lens. Um, it gives you this mutual influence. Now, Although we do some work on solving the actual game, I think the bigger lesson for me is, is not so much that you literally formulate out the game as you literally solve it with uh, approximations to the game theoretic solution, but rather um, think about any kind of algorithm dash learning approach that you're developing for interaction through the lens of can it support this type of solution. So for instance, one interesting aspect of this, uh, of understanding this game theoretic influence is uh, kind of going back to this example. Think about an approach for interaction where you collect a bunch of data and then you do behavior cloning, you do imitation learning, right? So you get your car to drive in the way that humans drive. Well, humans don't do this, so you won't get this kind of coordination strategy, because you have never see the human does, do that. Now think about a different interaction strategy where you learn a um, model of human behavior based on human driving data, right? And it's just, just this black box model that is fit to prior data. Well, and then your robot sort of plans with that model of the human. Well, to get to this as the optimal solution, you have to query that model of the human under the hypothetical, like, hey, what, you, what would the human do if I start backing up? Which is not something that you've seen in the data, right? This is presumably will be an out of distribution query to this model that you've learned. And so I think if you know ahead of time that you should expect influence um, and you should expect that whenever the robot tries to solve its planning problem or its reinforcement learning problem, it will try to leverage that 
human model and query it in ways that are um, that with inputs that go outside of the distribution that you've collected, then you'll be in trouble and you won't necessarily find the optimal solution. So that's sort of one aspect that I think it's guided us in thinking, how do we make models that are can be actually robust to these queries that the DRL agent will need to make? How do I build human models that aren't just this black box but have some robustness guarantees? Um, or at least empirical robustness properties. Um, and so, it, again, it doesn't mean that you have to think of interaction as this is the game, we shall solve the game, but I think it does mean that you have to sort of embrace the fact that you should expect this mutual influence to happen and look at how your solutions might be able to support or fail to support the, um, the, this type of um, um, behaviors um, that look at influence. Um, and so we haven't... Uh, this is sort of something that we've, we're, we've been recently working on. But to give you an, an example of that, um, you know, I work a lot with Sergey Levin. He's very into offline reinforcement learning. So one thing that we're looking at with, um, um, with our joint student, Joy Hong, is what kind of data does an offline RL agent need to see? in order to produce behaviors that look like influencing behaviors that go outside of what you've seen in any kind of human-human data set that you've collected. Is that possible? You know, under what properties does that happen? And so, for instance, this is a benchmark called Overcook that I like a lot. Um, you have two agents, and they need to play this game together where they're making soup, and there's tomatoes, and there's onions, and there's plates, and they have to deliver it to these delivery locations, um, and they have to coordinate with each other on that. Uh, I cheat with this benchmark because it, it helps us actually study the th things that I'm really interested in, which is the coordination between the human and the robot, without actually having to have a physical human and a physical robot cooking onion soup together, which adds many layers of complexity on top of the core of what I'm interested in. And so, so cute little benchmark, and this is, I'll, I'll, I'll want to show two videos from Joey's work from a few weeks ago. Um, in this one, so this is um, going to be the, the offline RL agent here deployed against the real human player. Um, and um, what we do is we collect some human human data of people playing various uh, variations on this task, and then we give the robot sort of a, a new objective. And these objectives look like um, all of a sudden, in the game, you get a lot more points if the human is the one doing the delivery. Uh, all of a sudden, you get a lot more points if, the, if you make tomato soups instead of, instead of onion soups. And so the robot has to kind of find ways to sort of steer the person towards the solutions that end up being um, higher points. Um, and uh, in this little video, what happens is the robot just puts a plate here, and that sort of ends up kind of influencing the person to pick up the plate. And I'll play this again. The person sort of focused on putting ingredients in, um, but then and they had grabbed this onion they were waiting to put in, and then the robot sort of puts a plate there, and all of a sudden what the human does is like, okay, I'll get, the, I'll get rid of the onion and go and pick up the plate and, and pick up the soup. Uh, that, that's not a behavior that we see in the human-human data, but what we see in the human data is sort of pieces of it, like, you know, if there's a plate on the table in some particular types of situations, then the human is more likely to pick up the plate and do the soup if the plate is conveniently set for them, stuff like that. No human has ever, like, put a plate there to get the other human to do the, this in the data, but there's, like, aspects of this, and we're seeing to sort of how far we can push offline RL to sort of stitch together these behaviors. Here's another one where it's really useful to make tomato soup rather than onion soup, and so what the agent does is it's much more subtle than the previous one, but it sort of went, goes in there and kind of blocks access to the onions. And so the person's like, yeah, OK, I'll, I'll focus on the tomatoes, fine. And then they do that. Anyway, so that's the, sort of what I wanted to say about the game aspect. Um, let me go real, real quick to this partially observable aspect, because that's also important. It's not just about capturing this mutual influence. It's also about realizing that the players don't have full information about each other. and so. One aspect here is we talk about the human objective and the human taking actions. Um, and you know, maybe the human is going towards the pot of coffee because in their mind they would like to get some coffee. The robot doesn't necessarily know this, right? So 
it's not a general sum game where the objectives are well known to each other. Um, there might be partial information. Same in a driving situation. Um, we said like, okay, human has this objective going first, but wanting to avoid collisions. But I don't really know how the person kind of thinks about risk and safety versus wanting to be efficient. And maybe every person does it, that trade off in a different way. Um, so. Um, that's just a picture of someone tailgating. OK, so <laughs> uh, <laughs> that which happens. Some people really have a skewed trade-off of, uh, of safety versus efficiency. Um, so what's interesting about acknowledging that you actually don't know something about the human's internal state, their objectives, their preferences, their beliefs, and so on, um, is that all of a sudden you're going to think about what you do observe, which is the human actions, as your sort of sensor readings, the equivalent of these sensor readings in the, in the physical world, these are your sensor readings now that give you information about what's going on with this human objective that you need to know about. And so for instance, in this task, um, when I push on the arm, what it should do if it's operating in this partial observer system is it should try to interpret that external torque as being a sensor reading about what, what, what I have in mind. And realize that like, oh, OK, this is actually consistent with you probably having a preference of me not keeping these crazy margins, distances from the floor and the table and so on, and adjusting its behavior in response. And here's a generalization of that to like, speaking of generalization, right? So I think that's the right strategy. It's not render and impede. It's not go in gravity compensation mode. It's actually just, you know, adjust the way you're doing the task to better reflect what the person probably had in mind when they decided to start intervening and physically pushing on you. Uh, and this is with a, this is with a cup, right? Where the robot was about to spill. And the person sort of reorients the robot instead of spilling again and spilling again and spilling again. The robot sort of um, interprets that external torque as being evidence that is consistent with the person preferring to keep the cup level. Um, let's see. We're at 14. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip something. Give me one second. The way this all started for me was not in driving, was actually in manipulation. Um, and uh, it was about sort of the opposite direction. So much like the robot doesn't uh, know what the person wants, the person also doesn't necessarily know what the heck the robot wants. And so that's how I kind of got hooked into this area. Um, so I'll be remiss to give this talk without sort of paying some tribute to that. So here's the robot that I was working on in grad school. His name is Herb. And, um, here, Herb is going to pick one of these two bottles. Uh, notice that they're fused bottles because um, vision sucked back then. I mean, it kind of still does, but it's a lot better. So back then, there was no deep learning to deal with. And so we had um, these uh, fused bottles because they had SIFT features. And SIFT features were the features that were used as input to these object, uh, uh, these, these object detectors and, and uh, pose estimators. So and there's two fused bottles. Herb is going to go and grab one of them. You want to grab the other one. So now figure out which one Herb is grabbing. <laughs> when we ran this study, it was 50-50. It turns out to be this one over here. It might as well have been the other one. And so what's going on here is that the robot is behaving and an efficient way. I mean, it was kind of slowed down this motion to be able to run this experiment, but sort of it's taking um, a path very close to the straight line in its configuration space. It's very efficient. It's the right thing to do if you're just operating in isolation. Um, but it's not quite the right thing to do in this little game that we were playing when you're actually coordinating with a person. And so partial observability is kind of this two-sided coin where, yeah, you don't know about the human, and the human actions end up being sensor readings for you, the robot, but it's the other way around as well. The human doesn't know 
what the heck is up with this robot, and the robot's actions end up being sensor readings for the person. And if you acknowledge that, then what happens is you get to figure out what actions to take, where if it's in your best interest to do so, you kind of become informative with the actions that you're taking to the person so that they can more quickly understand what it is that your objective is. And that's what we did with something called legible motion, which became my thesis work, where we are running this optimization over the robot's actions, and you're seeing that you start off with a straight line in configuration space towards the goal on the right, which as we saw was pretty confusing. And as the robot is figuring out what actions will sort of update the person's belief the best, it's ending up kind of taking this motion that exaggerates to the right. And that ends up um, conveying to the person, look, it's this object on the right that I'm grabbing, not the one on the left. And again, exaggeration is one of the 12 Disney principles of animation. People, it's not surprising that you could use these principles, anticipation, exaggeration, et cetera, to make robots more clear, more expressive in their behavior, because people, Pixar does that with their characters all the time. Uh, but what was really cool is was just this was a, a consequence of optimal decision making in the system where you acknowledge, you embrace the partial observability uh, that the human has. And this is the trajectory. Okay. I'm going to skip the generalization part. Um, you can do this with driving styles, so you can sort of pick driving styles that are more informative or less informative about the robot's objective and its trade-offs between how efficient you want to be um, and how um, uh, safe you want to be. This does not fall out of optimal decision making as beautifully and crisply as I've said so far. But I wanted to include this example too because this is the closest I've come to actual Pixar-like characters. Okay, so here's what this is. This is a robot Cassie from Kausha's lab. And what we did here was um, we um, wanted to get Cassie to move in a way that is not expressive of its goal, but it's expressive of some emotion to a human. Okay, um, so that's the thing that the person doesn't know. It's some sort of you know quote unquote emotional state. Um, and we didn't, it didn't just fall out of optimal decision making. We had to do some work, and in particular, the work that we did here was to sort of train a mapping between um, trajectories and their valence arousal dominance, which is a three-dimensional space that corresponds to human emotions. And then what we could do is optimize trajectories that when projected into the space are very close to the sort of the target emotion we were doing. So we were doing optimization, but it required a bunch of work. It wasn't just like, oh, this strategy emerges, right? We got a lot of annotations. Um, similar here, uh, you know, I say great weather today. Now what I can do is I can use a language model to tap into this, to, to project into the valence around the dominant space, figure out what emotion that corresponds to, and then optimize for the robot to show emotion appropriate for that emotional content. So it didn't get the offer today, that sucks. And then the vacuum cleaner is more sad and close to the ground and less energy. Very cute, again, caveats. And I'd be remiss without showing Manet's work. Oh, she was in my lab of you know, robots expressing incapability. Like, I'm trying, but I can't actually, I don't have the force to open this cabinet. Okay, and we have to end. So what I'll say is, I don't think this is the full solution to interaction, but I think it, we benefit from recognizing that under the hood, we're trying to solve this partially observable general sum game. The game aspect gives us this sort of mutual influence that we should expect between robot actions and human actions. The partial observability sort of makes us embrace the fact that we don't know everything about the human, and their behavior ends up being evidence about the stuff we don't know, and vice versa, the human doesn't know everything about the robot. And so, I think there's, this, there's kind of this F equals MA of interaction um, that enables us to account for the human as part of the state and in turn enables uh, robots to use optimal decision making to actually generate strategies for coordination and interaction with people. Um, uh, I started with this book in 12th grade and I actually got to edit the robotics chapter in the fourth edition to actually talk about this game formulation and how underneath it all, this is how, this is the problem that robots should be solving, not in isolation. And I will admit that 
this is, wasn't a talk about how, it was a talk about what. What is the problem formulation? What are the aspects of it that are important that we should be embracing? Not any of how we actually solve these things. Um, there's been amazing students who've worked on solving these things. Um, Dorsa I mentioned, Jaime, Andrea, they've worked on the game aspect. Um, Dylan, uh, Andrea, Smitha, Kush, Rohan have worked on the partial observability aspect. Sandy has worked on the sort of the expressive aspect. If you want to know how to solve a game like this, the um, a full observability formulation, the best, the closest we've gone to is in David's work with Ellis and with Claire, where we're quadraticizing the costs and linearizing the dynamics and doing this iterative LQ game formulation. Um, I'll skip this part. Humans aren't optimal game players. Even if I could solve the game, that's not very, a very good um, description of how exactly the human will act. So we work a lot on how do we get good, robust human models by kind of combining these game ideas with data. And uh, we work a lot on, we'll get it wrong. Robots won't have great models of people ever. Uh, they might get better and better, but there'll always be error. So how important is that error? What theoretical consequence does it have on the inference that the robot does? How do I robustify that inference? How do I do, how do I detect that I have the wrong model? So those are all aspects of what it means to do work, kind of, but it's all grounded in this perspective of interaction as this partially observable dynamic general sum game, which has really been my F equals MA guiding uh, lens for interaction. So with that, thank you and thanks to all the members of my lab who've actually done this work, uh, past and present. Thanks for listening.